Psalm 34, verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them out of them all. The title of this message is Afflictions. Afflictions. The word afflictions occurs 13 times in the Bible. I believe a good definition is pains, sufferings, troubles. It says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. So if you're a righteous person, you're going to suffer many afflictions. This is not something that's for one person like Job that says many of the righteous shall suffer afflictions. Many of the righteous shall suffer pains, sufferings, and troubles. If you're a righteous person, you're going to suffer pains. If you're a righteous person, you're going to suffer troubles. If you're a righteous person, you're going to suffer sufferings, and so forth. Okay. So we need to understand this doctrine. Okay. So, the first thing I want to teach is, number one, is God seems to afflict righteous people, number one, for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. God allows people to suffer, righteous people to suffer pains, sufferings, and troubles for their own benefit. Number two is God allows righteous people to suffer pains, sufferings, and afflictions for his own glory as well. Okay? Number three is, if we are patient during our afflictions, if we are obedient to God during our afflictions, we're going to do great works for God. Okay? We're going to look at four men, in the Bi men of the Bible. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to look at four men of the Bible. Number one, Ezekiel the prophet. Number two, Paul the apostle. Number three, a man who is born blind. And number four, a man who is born of short stature by the name of Zacchaeus. We're going to conclude with the parable of the uh, mustard seed. And then I'm going to rip on uh, vaccinations for about 10 minutes, okay? So that's going to be tonight. So who is Ezekiel? Ezekiel is a major prophet of the Bible. The book of Ezekiel is 48 chapters long. It's one of the longer books of the Bible. Ezekiel has some of the hardest preaching in the Bible. It has some of the hardest preaching against sin in the Bible. And I tell you what, Ezekiel has some of the most funky you know, uh, uh, visions of any, of any book in the Bible as well. Okay? The Bible tells us that Ezekiel, he was a priest of God. He was about 30 years old when he received his first vision. And then he prophesied during the captivity while he was in Babylon. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month. This is chapter 1, verse 1. This is to talk about, talk about how old Ezekiel is. It's saying here that he's 30 years old, that he's four months old, that he's five days old. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chebar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. A good tip on studying the Bible is when God is really specific with the time, where he gives you the year, the month, and the day. It's time to pull out your pen and start taking some notes. Okay, Verse 2, And the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachim's captivity, who is Jehoiachim, he was an evil king of Judah, one of the last kings of Judah before they fell into captivity. Verse 2 again, In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 24. So at the time that Ezekiel was 30 years old, four months old, and five days old, that happened to be the same time that Jehoiachim had been in captivity for five years, zero months, and five days. Okay. Well, Ezekiel was taken in captivity the same time as Jehoiachim. So let's do a little math. If Jehoiachim was taken into captivity, if Ezekiel was taken into captivity uh, five years and five days before he was 30 years old, four months, and five days old, that means he was 25 years old, four months, zero days old when he was taken into captivity, okay? So let's look at 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 8. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he began to reign. Jehoiachin seems to be a man who had two chances at being king. The Bible tells us that Jehoiachin became king when he was eight years old, and he became king again when he was 18 years old, okay? So if Ezekiel is 25 years old, four months old, zero days old, and Jehoiachin is 18 years old, they're, they're contemporaries. 
and they're about the same, same, uh, same age and so forth. So Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months, and his mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, uh, which is a faraway land. Verse 10 again, at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. So Nebuchadnezzar brings his troops down, and they're surrounding Jerusalem. Okay, Verse 11, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. Verse 12, so what is uh, Jehoiachin's response to this? Is he going to put up a fight, or is he going to cave in? Verse 12, and Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers, and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. So in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he goes to surround Jerusalem. Jehoiachin does not put up a fight. He just gives up. Now, God praises that. God is warning throughout the prophets that he, he is bringing Babylon, and when he brings Babylon, he doesn't want them to resist you know, God's judgment at all. Okay? And if someone resisted God's judgment, they're going to be judged by God. So here we see Jehoiachin, he's giving up. Well, actually, God blessed Jehoiachin somewhat later on in his life, if you know his life really well. In the 37th year of his captivity, God raised him up and gave him some freedom and allowed him to eat at the king's table. I think one of the reasons why is because he was obedient you know, to this, that he actually gave up. He did not put up a fight against Nebuchadnezzar. Now, in notice, notice in verse 12, it says that Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin in captivity the eighth year of his reign. Okay, so if you know the book of Daniel real well, Daniel, who was a youth, went into captivity, captivity during Nebuchadnezzar's first year of his reign. Okay. So if Ezekiel is 25 years old and he goes into captivity during Nebuchadnezzar's eighth year of his reign, if Daniel was a youth and he went into captivity during Nebuchadnezzar's first year of reign, they're contemporaries. They're about the same age and so forth. Okay? Verse 13, And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasure of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land. So Nebuchadnezzar is taking 10,000 captives with him back into Babylon. And one of those captives is Jehoiachin. Another one of those captives is Ezekiel, verse 15. And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon and the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And all the men of might, even 7,000. So he's taking 7,000 military men. So 7,000 of the 10,000 captives are military men. So obviously Nebuchadnezzar liked warriors. And craftsmen and smiths, a thousand. So he's basically taking a thousand of your equivalent of engineers. So 7,000 of the 10,000 going to captivity are, are military men. 1,000 are uh, uh, craftsmen and smiths and so forth. All that were strong and apt for the war, even them of Babylon brought captive to king of Babylon. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter uh, 3. So Nebuchadnezzar, in the eighth year of his reign, he's taking 10,000 captives. He's taking the mighty of the land. He's taking the, the military men. He's taking the strong men. He's taking the well-nourished men. Okay? Now, Isaiah prophesied that, that when they went into captivity, they were going to walk around naked, barefoot, with their buttocks uncovered. Ezra chapter 7, verse 9 tells us that when Ezra went from Babylon to Jerusalem, it took him four months. Can you imagine walking around naked? barefoot with your buttocks uncovered for four months across the Middle East. That must have been a pretty hard time for those 10,000 captives. That must have been a pretty hard time for those 7,000 military men. That must have been a hard time for those 1,000 engineers and so forth. That must have been a hard time for Ezekiel and so forth. You know, I don't know if Ezekiel hated sin at the age of 25, but when he's 26 years old and he walked across the Middle East for four months naked, barefoot with his buttocks uncovered, I would imagine he hated sin, you know. 
And so, you know, I would imagine he was pretty fired up. And I think one of the reasons why it highlights that he was 30 years old in Ezekiel chapter 1, he's 30 years old when he receives his first revelation. I would imagine at the age of 30, that's when you're eligible to preach. This guy is a living priest, you know, priest. He was probably just eligible to start preaching right now, and I would imagine he's pretty fired up. He's pretty re ready to go on preaching. If you know the book of Ezekiel, that guy was pretty fired up when he preached about sin. Okay, let's go to chapter 3, verse 16. Chapter 3, verse 16 says, And it came to pass, and it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, okay, so this is seven days after chapter 1, verse 1. So chapter 1, verse 1, they've been in captivity for five years and five days. Now this is seven days later, so if you're doing your math, this is five years, 12 days later, okay? What happens five years, 12 days later? Let's go to verse 26. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 26. This is God speaking to Ezekiel. And I'll make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, and thou shalt be dumb, and shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. A house. So God is telling Ezekiel that from now on, you're going to be dumb. From now on, you are not going to speak. So from this point on, Ezekiel could not speak. The only time he could speak is when God opened up his mouth. Can you imagine being a preacher that the only time you open up your mouth is when God spoke through you? I would imagine your preaching is going to be pretty solid, okay? Yeah. So this is God telling Ezekiel, you are not going to say a word unless I'm speaking through you. I have a feeling this is why people sat in front of Ezekiel waiting to hear the word of the Lord, because he's going to say any other word. And so he was waiting to hear from the Lord so he could speak it to these people, okay? God opened his mouth when he was ready to speak with them. Why? Because he was dumb. Why is he doing this? Verse 26, and I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, and thou shalt be dumb, and shalt not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. He knows Ezekiel is pretty fired up on sin. He knows Ezekiel wants to rip some face, but he's telling him, they're going to rip your face off. They're going to kill you. He's not going to allow them to be a reprover. He's not going to allow him to use his words to speak against God's people because they're going to kill him. These are the same military men. These are the same engineers. This is the same king. These are the same people who tried to kill Jeremiah. He had to deal with them a few years ago. His ego's got the same crowd. He's got the wealthy of the land. He's got the powerful of the land. And when he starts ripping on sin, God's warning him, I'm not going to allow you to be a reprover. They're going to kill you. They're a rebellious house. I'm going to speak through you. And when they see that you're a sign of me, if they kill you for your preaching, they're basically killing me. So he's saying in a message, if you kill him for his words, you're basically killing me for my words. If you basically kill the chip of the block, chip off the old block, you're going after the block, and you're going to hear back from the block and so forth, okay? So God's, you know, I think a good point here is God has afflicted Ezekiel with dumbness for Ezekiel's benefit. He's saving Ezekiel's life so he can preach and rip on sin against the people, okay? Now, I would imagine being dumb, not being able to speak, that's probably an affliction. <laughs> you know, I think that falls under the category of pains, sufferings, and troubles, and so forth. I mean, imagine this. He can't have a normal conversation with his wife. He can't have a normal conversation, you know, he can't have a normal conversation just outside of, of, of anywhere. He probably couldn't even go to BurgerFi, cash out his gift card, and order at BurgerFi because his mouth is dumb. Now, if, you can't, if you're at BurgerFi, you can't place an order, that's an affliction. That's a, power, you know, that's a pain. That's a suffering. That's a trouble as well. Okay? So this man, you know, something seriously is happening to him. He cannot speak. Okay? You say, well, how long couldn't he, couldn't he speak? Was this for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, so forth? Let's go to chapter 24. Chapter 24, verse 24, this is God speaking through Ezekiel. Thus Ezekiel's unto a sign. 
Thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign according to all that he hath done shall ye do. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Also thou, son of man, shall it not be the day when I take from them their strength, the joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, that whereupon they set their minds, their sons and their daughters. He's referring to the temple at Jerusalem. It's a joy of their eyes and so forth. Verse 26. That he is, that escapeth in that day shall come unto thee to cause thee to hear it with thine ears. In that day shall thy mouth be opened to him which is escaped, and thou shalt speak and be no more dumb, and thou shalt be assigned unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So here we see in chapter 3, verse 26, God's telling him he's going to be dumb. He has no idea how long he's going to be dumb. I mean, it's going to be for the rest of his life and so forth. God tells him in chapter 24 that he will lose his tongue when Jerusalem falls. When someone escapes from Jerusalem and, and proclaims in Babylon that, that Jerusalem has fallen, that is when God is going to loose his tongue. Okay. Well, let's see when that happens. Let's go to chapter 33. Chapter 33, verse 21, And it came to pass in the twelfth year. And it came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the month, that one had escaped out of Jerusalem, came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. Now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening, after he that was escaped came and had opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning, and my mouth was opened, and I was no more dumb. So here we see that in the twelfth year of their captivity, in the tenth month of their captivity, in the fifth day of their captivity, someone escaped from Jerusalem, reported that, that Jerusalem was fallen, and that's when Ezekiel's tongue was loosed. So let's do a little math. If, 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 his, mouth was, was, with, if his mouth cleaved to his mouth in the fifth year, in the twelfth day of his captivity, if it was released in the twelfth year, in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the captivity, that's seven years, nine months, 23 days. So Ezekiel went without speaking for seven years, nine months, 23 days. And what's interesting is when you look at the book of Ezekiel, he never complains once. He doesn't complain at all, and he's completely obedient to God. God had him do some amazing things. I mean, right after chapter 3, verse 26, God tells him to lay him on one side for 390 days and eat dung. <laughs> he has him lay on the other side for 45 days and eat dung. He didn't put up a complaint with that. He went ahead and was obedient with that. Later on in the book of Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel that he's going to kill his wife. And he doesn't want him to complain or mourn about that. Ezekiel did was very obedient to God, and he was... You know, he had a good attitude during this affliction. Even when he was dumb for seven years, fought nine months, 23 days, he didn't put up a complaint with God. Number, you know, the, second, the first point I want to say is sometimes God afflicts righteous people for their own benefit. Ezekiel was made dumb to preserve his life. God allowed him to do that. Point number two is, is uh, sometimes God afflicts people for his own benefit. So Ezekiel did some amazing stuff after his tongue was cleaved. Okay? Now, if you look at the teaching from chapters 3 through 33, it's some of the hardest preaching against sin in the Bible. There are some hardcore judgments. But that's primarily all he preached on was judgment. But right after this, you see his ministry expand you know, quite a bit. You hear a lot of preaching uh, from pre uh, preachers saying there seems to be two parts of Ezekiel. One is where he's ripping on sin, and another part is where he's doing, you know, preaching on other stuff. Well, that key standpoint or that key event is right here in chapter 31, verse 21, when his, it, when his tongue is loose. When God loosed his tongue, it was almost like Ezekiel had earned his way to the next level. Because he had a good attitude about his afflictions, because he was obedient to God, God blessed him the more as well. So point number two is sometimes God afflicts people for his own benefit. He was able to do great works through Ezekiel. And because Ezekiel had a great attitude, because he continued to be obedient to God, he, he expanded, he did greater works with this ministry. I mean, let's look at what he preached after this. After chapter 33, we have chapter 34, 
uh, chapter 34, verse 1 starts out, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. So we see him prophesying against sinners. We see him you know, speaking judgment. But there's a, there's a message of hope. Verse 11, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Verse 12, As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. So he's now preaching some hope. He's preaching some restoration. Let's go to chapter 37. Chapter 37, verse 1, is a very popular uh, passage of the Bible. Chapter 37, verse 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which is full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. This is a very popular passage of the Bible. How many are, are, are you are familiar with this? You know, a lot of people are. This is a powerful passage of the Bible. It's a very popular passage of the Bible. And it came after he was done for seven years, nine months, 23 days. So after seven years, nine months, 23 days, Ezekiel is now preaching hope. He's now preaching restoration. Not only that, but he's preaching end times prophecy as well. Verse chapter 38. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach, and Tubal. So he's preaching about Gog and Magog. How many have heard of Gog and Magog? This is the only time in the Bible where you find Gog and Magog. So after he's done for seven years, nine months, 23 days, he's preaching some prophecy that almost everyone who's studied prophecy has ever heard of. Let's go to chapter 40 through 48. Chapter 40 through 48, he's talking about Ezekiel's temple. This is a very popular passage of the Bible. He's now preaching about the temple. Chapter 47 Chapter 47, verse 1, Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 47, verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. He's talking about the temple, Ezekiel's temple. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. Behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Verse 9, and it came, and it shall come to pass that everything that liveth which moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. I heard Pastor Anderson preach that this verse, verse 9, is actually on some building in Sacramento. This is a pretty you know, popular verse. A lot of people understand Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, and they call it Ezekiel's temple. So what's interesting is after Ezekiel suffered affliction, after he suffered pains, sufferings, and tribulations, and so forth, he did some of the greatest works. He did some of his greatest preaching. A lot of people heard of Gog and Magog. A lot of people heard of the Valley of the Dry Bones. A lot of people heard of Ezekiel's temple. All this happened after God sent him through that affliction. After God sent him through that affliction, he greatly expanded his ministry as well. So point number three is if we're patient during our afflictions, if we continue to be obedient to God, we will do great works for God. A vast majority of the people you know, think of Ezekiel as Ezekiel's temple or the valley of bones and so forth. So because of that, because he was patient during his tribulations, he did great things for God. Let's go to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 12. So that's Ezekiel. Now let's look at Paul the Apostle. While you're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, verse uh, 1, I'm going to read to you Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, this is when Apostle Paul is on the way to Damascus and he, has a, he experiences the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ speaks to Ananias regarding to, to this event. He says, for I will show him how great things he must suffer. He's talking about Apostle Paul. 
for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ acknowledging that Apostle Paul is going to suffer many things as well. This is one of the affirmities he had to suffer. Chapter 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. This is Apostle Paul talking. It is not expedient. Obedient for, doubt, for me, doubtless to the glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter, of such and one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine affirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of, revel of the revelations. So Apostle Paul received an abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So Apostle Paul acknowledges that he received a lot of revelations. Okay, If you want to receive a lot of revelations, we need to follow the example of Apostle Paul. Number one, I would imagine the Apostle Paul read a lot of scripture. Number two, it seems that Apostle Paul understood language very well. Not only was he fluent in Greek, but he was fluent in Hebrew as well. He understood the language as well. I, I believe the two keys for under us understanding a lot of Scripture, the two keys for us if we want to receive revelation from God is, number one, we have to read a lot of Bible. Number two, we have to study or we have to know the language well. Years ago, I went to a seminary. I went to a Fuller Theological Seminary, and I think by and large, it was complete garbage. It was a waste of time. I was unsaved when I went to seminary, and I was even more unsaved when I came out of seminary. <laughs> I took about 24 to 28 classes. I think they were all bad except for one. There was one class I actually got something out of it. And it was called a writing composition class. And ironically, it was taught by a professor who was not part of the <laughs> seminary. It was taught by some outsider. And number two, it was ironic that the text that he used was a, a worldly text. It was not a, a Christian text at all. Now, the, the title of the, the, the class was Writing Composition. Okay? We, were, we were taught to analyze composition. Now, in the business world, there's people called accountants, financial analysts, and so forth. These people are able to take a massive corporation, whether it's a manufacturing corporation, financial services, or whatever, and they can break that corporation that employs thousands of people into numbers. They can break it down in numbers and ratios, and they can tell you whether that corporation is doing well or not. They can break down those numbers and analyze those numbers and tell you whether that corporation is improving or not improving and so forth. What's interesting is you can do the same thing with writing composition. You know, in the business world, they look at ratios like profits, they look at costs, they look at inventory and things like that. You can analyze someone's writing. Okay? So what we did was we looked at the writings of Ernest Hemingway, we looked at the writings of F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald, which are considered great authors in the world's eyes. And what's interesting is when you look at the numbers, we look at the number of sentences per paragraph, and the number of words per sentence, the number of syllables per words, and so forth. We also looked at the number of prepositional phrases and so forth. When you looked at their numbers, it was really unusual in that each writer has his own fingerprint. Okay. So when you look at all of Ernest Hemingway's writings and you look at his numbers, they're all consistent for every book that he wrote, essay he wrote, and so forth. When you look at F. Scott Fitzgerald, all his numbers are consistent. You know, Jesus taught that the out of the mouth speaketh the abundance of the heart. 
It seems when you write an essay, it's like, you know, out of the abundance of your knowledge of that language and so forth, okay? That, so when you write that pen, it comes out from your knowledge of, of that language and so forth. And I would imagine if, if I were to give some, each person in here 10 sheets of paper and told you to write 10 essays, and, you, and one of those essays was tell me about your family vacation. Number two was es a two-page essay, tell me about your family. Another essay might be tell me about your conversion when you got saved and things like that. If we were to analyze your writings, all of your writings will have the same numbers and so forth. Okay? So it's pretty interesting that each single writer has their own little thumbprint. Now, the goal of this book was that it was geared for professional writers. If you want to be a professional writer and more like Ernest Hemingway, you had to do figure out your own numbers and then you know, try to structure your writing to match Ernest Hemingway. Or if you want to match someone like F. Scott Fitzgerald or whatever writer that you like, you had to consciously start making your sentences longer, start using you know, bigger words, more complex language, and so forth. And that was the goal of the text. That wasn't what you know, our goal was in the class. We were just you know, taught this. Now, I applied this. My, my term paper was, I want to apply this to the Bible. So I looked at the various writings in the New Testament, and I, and I looked at the numbers. I looked at the numbers for the Gospel of Matthew. I looked at the numbers for the Romans and things like that. And not only did I look at the, uh, uh, the, the Greek, but it seemed that the Greek and the English matched 100%, so I looked at the English more. What's interesting is I saw a lot of... A lot of consistencies in there. The guy who wrote the Gospel of John is definitely the guy who wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. The numbers match identical. The guy who wrote 1 Peter is the same guy who wrote 2 Peter and so forth. The guy who wrote the book of Acts is the same guy who wrote the book of Luke and so forth. And you know, these different writers, they had their own style, they had their own numbers, but you know, when, they're, when you looked at other epistles, they all matched up. The guy who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he wrote nothing else. <laughs> there was nothing even close to you know, his numbers and so forth. The, definitely the guy who wrote the, the book of Romans is the guy who wrote 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and so forth. Now, my burning desire was to answer who wrote the book of Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter, he, the book of Hebrews is, in my seminary, was a very controversial book. And there was a lot of speculation who wrote the book of Hebrews. And the reason why, you know, there was a lot of speculation is the book of Hebrews does not tell you who wrote it. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who has sundry times in diverse manner, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. It doesn't start out like Romans does, where it says Paul, a sermon of Jesus Christ, called an apostle. It doesn't start out like Galatians, where it says Paul, an apostle, not a man, not by man. I messed that up. But, you know, each, each epistle has, introduces who they are. Now, Hebrews is the only one that doesn't tell you who it's written by. And I heard all kinds of, you know, screwy theories on who wrote Hebrews. I had one theologian, one of my professors said a woman must have wrote it. <laughs> Why would a woman wrote it? She doesn't want to put down her name. She doesn't want to say Sophia, servant of Jesus Christ, you know, called the Hebrews and so forth. So I heard a lot of crazy things. So my, my goal was, okay, let's look at the numbers of Hebrews. And it, the guy who wrote Romans is the guy who wrote Hebrews. The guy who wrote 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians is the guy who wrote Hebrews. I mean, it just matched up perfect. It was, it was the same numbers exactly. So to me, I, you know, I just answered the essay, okay, obviously Paul wrote it because it's his signature. It's the way he, he writes. Now, what's interesting is Apostle Paul is a very complicated writer. When you look at his statistics, they are just off the chart. They're completely different than Matthew, completely different than John, and so forth. And those of you who read a lot of Bible, you know that Paul uses some really big sentences. He's got some complicated grammar. And what's interesting is when you look at false prophets or when you get, look at people who are falling into false doctrine, what, you know, whether it's Calvinism or modalism or whatever, they seem to really mess up Paul. They have a hard time with Paul's writings. Either they, can, they don't know the language well enough to figure out what's going on, or they're preying upon people's misunderstanding or lack of knowledge of, of the language and getting them to fall into false doctrine. You know, they, it's, it's one of those two situations. So Paul is a very complicated writer, and I, I say that because I believe the reason why he got so much revelation is, number one, he read a lot of Bible, but number two, he understood the language. He knew the grammar. So my recommendation for, you know, people, if you really want to get a lot of revelation this year, you know, just grab a grammar, English grammar. Learn some basic grammar, and God will bless you big time. Because, you know, 
if I were to read the Spanish Bible five hours a day, I'm not going to get any revelation because I don't know Spanish very well, you know, hardly at all. You know, if you don't know English very well, it doesn't matter. If you're going to read a ton of Bible, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of revelation. But if you understand basic grammar and you can understand, uh, you know, complex sentences, God's going to bless you big time. So why did Paul receive so many revelations? Number one, I believe, is, is he read a lot of Bible. But number two, the guy knew new language and so forth. So back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. That was a long rabbit trail. Now let me see if I can get back. Verse 7 explains why Paul received an infirmity in his flesh. You know, infirmity is a physical ailment. God allowed Paul to receive a physical ailment, verse 7, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. So God allowed Paul to receive uh, affliction because to keep him humble, because he had received so much from the Lord. And Paul acknowledges this. And the Bible tells us, verse 7, that Satan is the one who delivered this affliction. Satan is the one who delivered this infirmity. You know, Satan doesn't give people blisters. He gives them some pretty fir- serious infirmities. And the Bible tells us right here that Paul asked three times for God to heal him. I would imagine he was in pr- some pretty serious pain. If Satan's the one who's delivering this affliction and Paul's asking to be healed three times, he probably had some you know, pain. When you look at the book of Job, Satan afflicted Job with boils from head to toe. So I would imagine, I don't know what his infirmity was, but it sounds like he was under some you know, quite a bit of affliction. But number one is God allowed him to be afflicted to keep himself humble for his own benefit. Point number two is because of this, because he was able to fight through this, God was able to use him in much greater capacity. Verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, and might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When we are under affliction, God's strength can be made perfect. Those of you who want to you know, make God's strength perfect, we do need to suffer some afflictions. We do need to suffer some sufferings and, and, and troubles and so forth. Most gladly, look at Paul's, uh, Paul's response to this. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So this guy is, is like Ezekiel. He has a great attitude during his affliction. And God is honoring that and giving him even more revelations. Therefore, verse 10, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then and am I strong. So Paul was very content even though he was afflicted. Point number three is we need to be content as well when we're afflicted. And if we are so and we are continue to be obedient to God, we're going to do great works for God. Okay? Let's look at uh, another man. Let's go to John chapter 9. So point number one is God, af- God afflicts people sometimes for their own benefit. Point number two is sometimes God uh, allows people to suffer affliction for his own benefit. Point number three is if we have a good attitude, if we continue to be obedient to God, he's going to do powerful things for us. John chapter 9 is about a man who was born blind. And as Jesus passed by, this is verse 1, John chapter 9, verse 1, he saw a man which is blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while his day the night cometh when no man can work. So this is a man who is born blind. That's definitely affliction. When you're born blind, that is suffering. That is trouble. That is painful. I would imagine when he was a little boy, he had no idea why he was born blind. But here we see that he was born blind in order to glorify God. Let's look at the, uh, at the end of the chapter. Verse 36, chapter 9, verse 36. And he, this is a blind man, answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? He's talking about the Son of God. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Verse 41, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. This... 
Chapter 9 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. This guy schools the Pharisees. He makes them look pretty bad. Okay? This guy is able to see the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And this guy might have just gotten saved on this particular day. So because this man was poor and blind, a lot of wonderful things happened to him. I would imagine if you were asking right now, was it worth it? Was it worth being born blind? He would probably say yes. He would probably say, yes, I got to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I got to rebuke the Pharisees and so forth. Yes, I got to, you know, you know, worship him and so forth. So this is a man that was born blind in order to glorify God. This is a man who was afflicted in order to glorify God. Let's go to uh, uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 is a wonderful story of a man by, by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a man of short stature. Luke chapter 19, verse 1, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was a pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down, received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with the man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. So the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus was a man of short stature. Because of that, because he had zeal to see Jesus, he had to climb a sycamore tree. Because he climbed a a sycamore tree, Jesus noticed him, and Jesus invited him to come over his house, okay? And when he's over at his house, he's saying, this day is salvation, come to this house. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, for whatever reason, people with short stature, the short kids were made a lot of fun of. That never made a whole lot of sense to me, because they can't control how tall they are. But for whatever reason, you know, shorter people sometimes are made fun of. I would imagine, you know, maybe in Zacchaeus' lifetime, he probably wished he was taller. Maybe, you know, when he was a little kid, he was wondering, why am I so short and so forth. Now, Pastor Anderson preached a powerful uh, sermon on Zacchaeus, and he pointed out Zacchaeus is a very rare person. He's one of the few people who actually gets saved and walks in the Spirit right away. (laughs) I mean, this guy gets saved, and he's selling half his possessions. He's sorry for his sins, and so forth, and he's climbing trees, and so forth. I mean, it sounds like he was the only guy who climbed a tree. I mean, he just wanted to look at at, at, at Jesus. And because he was short of stature, Jesus noticed him. I would imagine if he was six foot six, he wouldn't be climbing a tree. He would just watch, you know, Jesus. Maybe he would have had zeal in his heart and so forth. But I think God made him of short stature because God knew he was going to have great zeal for the Lord. And he wanted him to climb up the tree because the Bible says, uh, uh, you know, let your light shine before men. You know, people are seeing this guy climb the tree, seeing this guy's zeal. Because of that, Jesus invited himself over to his house. And, you know, when Jesus traveled, he came with an entourage of soul winners. I would imagine some of them gave, you know, Zacchaeus, you know, the gospel that day, got the guy saved. So not only that, not only did he probably get saved that day from climbing that tree, but a lot of people saw his zeal. He turned from sin and so forth. That might not have happened if he was six foot six. You know, sometimes, you know, God gives people afflictions. For our own benefit, sometimes God gives affliction for His own benefit, and when we have the right attitude, when we're obedient to God, we are blessed, you know, immensely. So, point number one is God, you know, sometimes afflict people for their own benefit. Point number two is sometimes God afflicts people for His own benefit. Point number three is go to Mark chapter four. Is that when we are obedient to God, when we have a good attitude? to God, and we continue to be obedient that God's going to bless us and we're going to do great works for God. Chapter 4, verse 30 is a parable of the mustard seed. 
Mark chapter 4, verse 30, and he said, Jesus said, Wherein to shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth forth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So Jesus talked about the kingdom of God is like unto a mustard seed. A mustard is an herb. It's a plant. But you see that this mustard seed will grows into something that's like a tree. The Bible uses uh, the word tree uh, in reference to a lot of times mighty men, rulers, kings, and so forth. Now, the mustard is a very humble plant, but it seems to do tree-like qualities. Okay? Now, we live in a society that builds men up. We live in a society that tries to lift up men so we glorify men rather than God. Years ago, a friend of mine uh, played professional, uh, college football, and he did so well, it looked like he had the opportunity to play in the professionals. Now, the problem is he came from an unknown school. No one had really heard of him. Well, when he tested with the pro scouts and when he was evaluated, he was, like, doing really well. And the pro scouts is saying, this, this guy's the number one draft pick. This guy's going to go in the first round, meaning he's probably going to be a millionaire. Well, when the media heard this, they immediately just started interviewing him and so forth. And it was amazing when they interviewed him how much they built him up, how much they lied about him. They added 19 pounds of muscle onto his frame. <laughs> they knocked two-tenths of a second off his 40-yard dash. I mean, this guy became the fastest quarterback who ever walked on the football field. Not only did that, but they had knocked seven or eight uh, golf strokes off his golf game. I have no idea, but apparently this guy could play with Tiger Woods and so forth. So I'm reading one of these articles. I'm thinking to myself, man, I didn't realize this guy was that good. I got to ask for his autograph the next time I see him and so forth. And then the thought dawned on me, if they're doing this for a guy from an unknown school, what are they doing to the guys who come out of Florida State? What are they going to do to the guys coming out of Texas and Nebraska and so forth? If they're lying about this guy, they're lying about all these guys. We live in a society that builds men up. We live in a society that builds them up so we glorify men rather than God. But that's not God, how God works. God breaks his people down. He breaks us down. He humbles us so we can build him up, so we can lift him up, so that his strength become perfect through our own weakness. Here we have a humble mustard seed that's acting like a tree. We have a humble mustard seed that's doing great things, that's providing shade for animals, that's providing you know, branches and support for animals and so forth. You know, we as humble people, when we're broken down, we can do great things for God. We can provide shade for the people. We can you know, have like king-like qualities where we can help people out and so forth. So I think this, uh, this parable of the mustard seed, it really fits in that God breaks his people down. Why? Sometimes for our own benefit. Why? So we can benefit God, so we can profit, you know, profit Him as well. And also, finally, if we have a great attitude, if we are obedient to God's commands, we're going to do great things for the Lord. Bearing that in mind, uh, I suffered a little affliction about a year ago. Now, about a year and a half ago, I left my job and started working for the church, and I had the opportunity to become a missionary to go to Botswana. I did a lot of planning for that. I think I spent about five months you know, planning for that. I did some preaching throughout the various churches. Um, I, I did a lot of studying on Botswana. I tried learning the language and so forth. I had these huge goals that thousands of people were going to get saved a year and that you know, we're going to train disciples and we were going to flood southern Africa with the gospel and so forth. So I had a lot of great expectations. We have a great banner commemorating that. And I had people shaking my hand and wishing me well and so forth. It was very powerful. So when I was heading over to Africa, I really had high expectations. Well, I didn't last 72 hours over there. <laughs> and I'm coming back on that plane is, is why, why did I waste that much time? Why did I even go through that? And I was wondering, why was I afflicted? I mean, it really looked like we were going to do a powerful work over there for God. And so I was really wondering what my future was, but, you know, why did all this happen? Because we sent 20 soul winners over there. You know, we were going to blast that country with, with the gospel and so forth. So I had a lot of questions. Why was I afflicted? Well, point number one is sometimes God afflicts people for their own benefit. 
it made a little more sense when my wife became pregnant. And when we became pregnant, I immediately uh, started thinking, well, well we're going to go through a midwife. We're not going to go through the doctors. Well, first of all, when you look at midwives, there's a lower C-section rate there, but also a lot of midwives know the truth about vac vaccines. Well, I don't know about you, but I think vaccines are unclean. Amen. When you look at the ingredients in those things, when you look at what they're made from, where they come from, it's not clean. You know, vaccines are destructive to people. It's destroying our society. It's destroying the world and so forth. Now, when I got saved, I understood the science behind vaccines. And to me, it became obvious that vaccines were unclean. There's no way I'm going to vaccinate my kids. So when it came to, you know, when my wife delivered the child, I was just going through the, go the midwife, you know, route. Well, it so happened that when she was diagnosed to have twins, we had to go through the doctor route. And I thought, oh, man. Now I'm going to have to fight the doctors, I'm going to fight the nurses, and things like that. So I started doing a lot of research on vaccines. And I remember uh, in, the, in the room with her, in the hospital room, we were really looking at the data and so forth. And when we saw just how destructive they were, and you know, here's the numbers I was looking at. Apparently, one out of 43 children born today are born with autism. That's a huge difference when I was a kid, it was one out of 15,000. So one out of 15,000 30, 40, 50 years ago had autism. Today is one out of 43. That's 2.5%. So if you give birth to a child today through the normal medical route, you have a 2.5% chance that that, that child is going to be born with autism. Now, I'm supposed to have twins. So you go two times two and a half, that's 5%. So there's a 5% chance that one of my twins is going to be born with autism. Not only that, but my twins are African-American. My wife's African. I'm American. That means my boys are African-American. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I found a statistic, and the government has done everything they could to hide this statistic, but for whatever reason, African-American boys have a 300% increased chance of getting autism. They've tried to hide that for years. It just finally came out a few years ago. So now I'm thinking my 5% chance is now up to 15% chance, that there's a 15% chance that one of my boys is going to be born with autism. Not only that, but when you look at twins, a lot of twins are born premature. Well, you know, when you're born premature, you're like a little tiny baby. So when you shoot up that baby with a bunch of mercury, a bunch of aluminum, a bunch of cancer-causing agents, it's going to go even worse for that little baby who, who's a preemie and so forth. Now, I found some, some statistics saying if you got a, a preemie baby in NICU, your chance of getting autism are like skyrocket. They want to put a number on it. But now I'm looking at there's a significantly greater than 15% chance that one of my two boys is going to get autism when they get birth. So there is no way I can allow a needle to go into those boys. And I remember talking to my wife. I said, we need to draw a line right now in the sand that we are going to fight this. We are going to fight this to the end. If I have to die over this, I'm going to die. If I have to kill someone over this, I'm going to kill someone. No one's sticking a needle in one of my boys. Okay? And she was on fire with that. And we found a, a testimony out there. You know, we did listed a lot of documentaries. Apparently, a pediatrician in Portland, Oregon said the nurses in Portland, Oregon, even if you don't want to vaccinate, they vaccinate anyway. They go behind your back and they vaccinate your kids because they figure you don't know what you're talking about. So here we are in, in, the, uh, in the room, and nurse is kind of listening to what we're looking at. She's listening to the document, documentaries and so forth. So we asked her, we said, okay, the nurses in Portland, Oregon, they vaccinate the kids no matter what. What do the nurses in Phoenix do? And she got a little offended, and she said, we have banner health. We respect patients' relationship. We respect your, your, uh, your desires. If you don't want to vaccinate your child, we're not going to vaccinate them. And after we shared some data with her and so forth, she said, I will make sure no one vaccinates your child. So here we are. It's, it's, it's the, the day of birth. One child comes out. He's screaming. He's grasping for his breath. The other child comes out 10 minutes later. He's screaming, gasping for his breath. Instead of shooting them up with 450 micrograms of aluminum, what's interesting is, is, is a woman cried out. She was the head of the NICU, and she said, Dad, she said, it says here that no hepatitis B vaccine, is that correct? 
I said, that's correct. And she said, so be it, no hepatitis B vaccine. And there were about 10 or 12 nurses in there. They all heard that, and I believe they honored that request that no one vaccinated the kids because the kids seem to be developing well and so forth. Okay? So I'm thankful for that. So here we are. You know, I did a little research, and you know, when I found out that, that my wife was going to give birth, there's no way that we're going to hit you know, the kids with vaccines. Okay? Well, the long, make a long story short, here I am going back to America from Botswana and wondering why was I kicked out of Botswana? Well, to me, it made a lot of sense is when my wife gave birth, the first, one of the first questions out of her, her parent or her, her uh, family's mouth is, did you vaccinate the kids? Botswana is hardcore on vaccinations. It's mandatory on vaccinations. And when we told them no, they did not like to hear that because they're brainwashed. Even though Botswana is a religious society, they, it's mandatory vaccinations. And finally, her, her mom conceded and said, well, it's a good thing you weren't living here. She said, if you don't vaccinate your kids here, they would have thrown Garrett into prison for two years and they would have taken your kids from you. Sometimes God afflicts people for their own benefit. There is no way I would want my family destroyed over something, over a vaccine. Maybe one of the reasons why we got kicked out of Botswana is so my kids want to be raised by the state, so I want to be thrown into jail and so forth. And you know, when we got thrown out of Botswana, Pastor Anderson became a household name in Africa. We've done a lot of powerful ministry in Africa. We've sent a lot of teaching CDs, DVDs over to Africa. You know, we got bombed on, on the phone calls, on the emails, people in Africa saying, please come on over and preach to us. Well, one of the places we went to was Malawi. We got about 3,000 people saved in Malawi, and apparently they're still saving people over there. That would have never happened if we didn't get kicked out of Botswana. We might not have gone into Guyana if we didn't get kicked out of Botswana and so forth. So you never know what happens. Sometimes God afflicts people for his own benefit as well. Okay? So, you know, make a long story short, maybe that's why we got kicked out of Botswana. You know, so when we're afflicted from God, sometimes it's for our own benefit. When we're afflicted by God, sometimes it's for his own benefit. And you know, you know, Botswana is is you know hard on vaccines. Africa seems to be hard on vaccines. I did a little research on Malawi, and, you know, there is vaccines by gunpoint over there. And I questioned their government on it, and I told them, I pointed to the news source I saw, and they said, you know, they never responded to me. I said, okay, if I renew my visa and I go over there with my family, what's going to happen? Am I going to have problems with the government or not? Because here's the thing. My plan in Botswana, my plan in Malawi, one of my first sermons was going to be against vaccines. I mean, if you're a shepherd of people and you see this society being destroyed by vaccines, and my wife, when she learned the truth about vaccines, she said, oh, that explains why that baby died, or that explains why that baby is, is slow learning. I mean, she knew you know, people in her family or in her neighborhood who suffered from vaccines, but they're so blind over there, they don't know that. I would definitely, one of my first sermons, you know, I preached one sermon in Malawi, it was about the word of God, but I was thinking very seriously about preaching against vaccines because those people need to hear that. I mean, if you have a flock of people, you do not want them to take vaccines and so forth, okay? So, you know, Africa is definitely a place where it's mandatory vaccines. And, you know, quite frankly, the United States is moving that way as, as well. They are taking away our rights. You know, the, the goal of or, uh, 2010 has been labeled the, the decade of the vaccines. The goal by 2020 is that 90% of all Americans will be fully vaccinated and 90% of all Americans will be fully vaccinated. The way they know whether they're vaccinated or not is, is doctors are, are uploading their medical records to, uh, to uh, the government right now, so they know whether you're vaccinated or not. After 2020, the, the goal is that the entire population of America would be vaccinated. Well, they're, apparently they're, past, they're starting to think about legislation saying that you won't be, not be able to uh, renew your driver's license unless you're fully vaccinated. You will not be able to get on an airplane and fly unless you're fully vaccinated as well. So the stuff that's going over in Malawi, uh, in Malawi and Botswana, it might be happening over here as well, okay? So that's just something we need to pray about, need to keep in mind as well, okay? But the good thing is many of the afflictions are the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. So when we're afflicted by God or we're afflicted by Satan or we're afflicted by other people, 
God will deliver us out of that. But we need to have a great attitude. We need to be uh, obedient to the Lord. And if we are so, we will do great things for God. So the title of this message is Afflictions. God afflicts people sometimes for their own benefit. God afflicts people sometimes for his own benefit. And if we're obedient to God and we uh, have a good attitude, we will do great things for God. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. And Lord, I pray that it was understandable. Lord, and I, Lord, I pray that, that people will keep this in mind uh, when they are afflicted in the future, God. Because you tell us that many are the afflictions of the righteous. That we will be obedient to you and have a great attitude and do great things for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.